Hello and good morning from the city of Cape Town, where the World Economic Forum Africa officially starts today. My name is Fifi Peters. Of course, this week, the Mother City will be the central meeting point for business, for governments, and for investors looking to do deals and also looking to grow stronger African economies. One of the critical elements to strong economic growth is, of course, infrastructure development. And that is what we're going to be discussing this morning. We will be looking at the current projects currently in the pipeline and the their impact, but more importantly, discussing the future projects and also how to grow that investment pipeline. I am not alone. I will be in conversation with an esteemed panelist, and I'd like to introduce them at this moment. Uh, sitting next to me is Patrick Lamini, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And then there is also T. P. Jojo, Chief Executive Officer of the Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, seated next to him, Vivian Yida, the Director General of the East African Development Bank and also Saif Malik, the regional co-head of Global Banking for Africa and in the Middle East at Standard Chartered. Of course, so we are joined by a room full of audience members and yourselves. And if you want to engage in the conversation with us, you can do so by using the hashtag AF19. You can also at CNBC Africa. We will certainly see your thoughts or comments on the discussion. On that note, let us kick off and actually dig into the matters that brought us here today, and that is that of infrastructure development. Perhaps by way of introduction, a brief overview of what you are currently working on on the continent within your respective institutions. Patrick? Thank you, Fifi. Uh, good morning, everyone. We, as the Development Bank of Southern Africa, we are a DFI owned by the South African government, charged with the responsibility of funding infrastructure in the sectors of energy, transport, water, ICT, as well as some social uh, sectors like in education, health, and, and bulk infrastructure for, for housing. We geographically, we have a geographic mandate that, that spans across the sub-Saharan Africa with much more strong emphasis on the, on the SADC region. And as for yourself, TP? Uh, good morning, Fifi. The, the Industrial Development Corporation, uh, similar to uh, my colleague, is a, is a South African-owned uh, bank, basically, development finance institution, and has a mandate that covers the whole of the African continent. Uh, but its uh, uh, sectoral focus is quite diverse in a sense that uh, the IDC finances projects, businesses in the across all sectors of the economy, in manufacturing, in mining, uh, including economic infrastructure, ports, uh, telecoms, transportation, and so on. Uh, we also go on further to participate extensively in supporting other development finance institutions across the continent uh, with uh, uh, financial instruments to advance their mandates. Of course, those financial instruments are something that we're going to be unpacking very soon. But Vivian, tell us more about your work on the continent so far. Well, good morning, all. The East African Development Bank uh, is an institution that uh, is concentrated in financing in the East African region. It's a regional DFI whose mandate is to support all sectors of economic development. So very much like the IDC, we focus on social sectors, economic sector, the financial sector. We also uh, provide advisory services. We work on the capital markets, in terms of capital markets development and also participation in the local capital markets. Lastly, mm -hmm. Saif. So I, I'm Saif Malik with Standard Chartered Bank. I, I'm not sure if I'm the thorn between the roses <laughs> or, or Vivian is the rose between the thorns, but the clearly fans. I'm the private sector's uh, <laughs> voice on this panel. Um, so we're. We, uh, you know, I think we proudly call ourselves one of the largest international banks in Africa. We have uh, operations in 15 markets where we have people on the ground um, and full-fledged banking services. And project finance and infrastructure finance is a very key component of what we offer to our clients. Um, and I'm very happy to say that the three colleagues sitting here are also our clients and partners. You're declaring any conflict right uh, there. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> TP, TP and Patrick, no. Uh, but um, it is, it is, it's the only way to go for a commercial bank is, is how do we find the solutions uh, to work with uh, our clients. And, you know, infrastructure is, is a huge um, need to move our, our continent forward. 
And I think the theme for, for this year's WEF, which is the fourth industrial revolution, has to be anchored and has to be driven by infrastructure development. So uh, we do participate very, very actively you know, in, on the continent, uh, specifically on infrastructure. I mean, I'm sure, Saif, uh, you wouldn't uh, disagree with me when I say that those words are probably not the first time uh, you have said them in terms of infrastructure development is a huge need for the continent. Yeah. We have known this. We've been discussing this for many, many years. Um, the question is, how do we ensure that we're actually moving that pendulum, pendulum clock forward? And Patrick, I'm coming to you right now because we're here to discuss growing that pipeline, future deals. When you assess a deal, um, and as DFI specifically, what is or what is the factor about that deal that ultimately allows you to you know cross the T's and dot the I's in terms of making them investable? What is an investable project to you? An investable project to us is a project that has got a very solid sponsor behind it. The, actually, the guys who are supporting uh, driving that project. It's a project also that is in a very conducive regulatory environment. And it's a project actually that is well prepared in terms of the early phase and the feasibility studies of it, well structured and well securitized in terms of de-risking it, allowing it, enabling the private sector to be crowded in. Because as the public sector, both as DFIs as well as governments, we do not have enough capital to make infrastructure happen on the continent. The bulk of this has got to come from the private sector. So our responsibility as DFIs is to make sure that we enable the successful crowding in of the private sector. When it becomes investable, it means it's now bankable. It means it's then economically makes sense and it's attractive to the private sector to be crowded in. So we are just there to make sure that we make that possible and we de-risk this, this, this project so that private sector can be able to come in and play their rightful role with the vast amount of capital that they have in their disposal. All right. There is a context to this elementary question I'm asking, and it's because the level of risk is, is or the appetite is not the same across the board. Um, in terms of what is an investable, investable project to uh, Patrick and to some of the other panelists that we're going to hear from, um, the Chinese could have a different view, and we have seen them go in on projects when maybe some of the panelists uh, seated here have said no. But for you, TP, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what makes you say, yes, this project is worth throwing my money behind? Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, an investable project, I think the kind of project which, after it has gone through a preparation cycle, is able to attract capital so that it is taken to realization and implemented. So let's take a step back. Uh, as you just said, the need for infrastructure has been well documented. It is there. We all know it. That's point number one. Point number two, the availability of particularly debt capital to finance projects is also available. The bankers in the room here can uh, say otherwise if I'm mistaken. The missing link then is generating projects that can then attract capital in order to find their way to realization. The third point I would like to make is, in recent years, I think maybe seven, ten years, there has been a massive proliferation of project preparation funds. Uh, funds that, if I say, may say so, that purport to invest money in the early phases of the development cycle of the project. But here's the question. How much money finds its way out of those project preparation funds into early stage investing so that projects can come through. And to that end, I would like to share a couple of experiences, and I'll just pick out one at this point in time. And that is that in the whole development cycle of a project, we have experienced at the IDC that different investors will have different levels of appetite. For instance, we are trying to do something now, and we are doing something now as the IDC together with the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa. And guess what? They are investing substantial amounts of money in the research and development phase, in developing prototypes, in producing uh, uh, a, a prototype and putting it to test in terms of technical feasibility. And the arrangement is simple. The IDC is not able to participate at that level, mm -hmm. given its appetite framework. But two steps down the line, the IDC could put in some risk capital 
to take it through the pre-feasibility stage, market testing, and so on and so on. So the point I'm making is, if we are able to orchestrate good partnerships where different players are able to plug the gap at various stages of the development cycle, perhaps sure. we might see a higher throughput. Sure, Vivian, would, would you agree there that, I mean, the deficit is there, the money is standing by, you know, wanting to, to, to find a home to make bigger returns. The problem is the number of projects that are there in the middle for this money to be attracted by. Um, in trying to solve that, that problem of the projects in the middle, for you, how would you define what is a project that would bring that money in? Okay. Um, I think, as has been said, um, a bank of a project is really determined by the investor, what they believe is bankable, and to some extent also the host country or the sponsor. So th I don't believe that there's a dearth of projects in Africa that uh, are bankable. Uh, there are very many opportunities in Africa for a reasonable uh, return on investment. I think the challenge comes in when th there's a perception that for a project to be bankable, uh, virtually all the risk would be stripped out or it should be virtually de-risked by the host country in, in terms of, say, say major infrastructure. Uh, and to that extent, of course, it becomes very, very difficult to, to structure a project where all the risk has been mitigated or taken up by the state. Um, but where there's an investor across the table who's willing to sit down and have a reasonable discussion and structure a project where the risks are reasonably mitigated, so that the end cost to the host country is reasonable and is sustainable in the long term, then you'll find that there's a, a large pool of projects that are, are ready for investment. Uh, on the, from the perspective of the host country, um, a bankable project would be one that the country can afford initially to implement, but also subsequently to operate and maintain in the long term. Because if these are large infrastructure projects, they have a long life cycle. We're looking 50, we're looking 100 years. So uh, it's important to project forward and see whether this infrastructure can actually sustain itself uh, for a long period of time. From a DFI perspective, uh, we would look at all that, but also consider the development impact uh, of a particular piece of inf infrastructure. Even if all the financial metrics uh, work out, but there isn't a significant a social or developmental return on it, then uh, we would probably not uh, finance it as opposed to a, a different project which might have more difficult financial metrics but has a very high social and developmental return. No, certainly. I mean, especially as we foster conversations around shared value and yes. increased mm -hmm. prosperity for all. But mm -hmm. say, give us a, a, a hint or a glimpse as to how a reasonable conversation would go like as a private sector player, mm -hmm. as a banker who does big business mm -hmm. um, on the continent by way of the infrastructure project space. I mean, for you to say yes in partnering with one of these guys here, what would need to be on the table in terms of that particular project? No, so I, I think everything that Patrick, DP, Vivian have said is absolutely correct. I think from, from, from our perspective and any, uh, you know, any private sector's perspective that we have shareholders who need to see value and who need to, you know, who need to get a return. And therefore, we need to have a bankable project that is affordable and gets paid back so that we can then churn it and, and get it around. And I think the challenge that we found, and this is what we've talked about, is that you have two sort of levels of projects on the continent today. You have one that's fronted by government, which is very important because that they are really driving the infrastructure. So be it, you know, with Chinese investments, uh, you know, be it with, um, you know, Japanese uh, investments, uh, Indian, European, the, the government's funded. Then there's a second one, which is sort of the private sector led, which is where I think we are struggling to get, you know, big bankable projects that have track records that have been created. You know, uh, in Nigeria, we are working very closely with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the Dangote group on the refinery and um, you know, on the um, uh, fertilizer plant. It's a huge project for, from an Africa standpoint. You know, and it, it's, it's one of the very few that stands on its own in sub-Saharan Africa that has been able to get to this point of completion. But you know, as a promoter and as, 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 a, as, a, as an owner, uh, Mr. Tangote took the initial steps. And, then, and that's when then you know, sort of the financing came through and we worked very closely with him. But it's, it's been a very difficult process to, to get it together. But now it's, it's at a stage of you know, good, uh, so it's, it's, it's created a track record. And then I think we are seeing that. We've seen that successfully in the oil and gas space, where we've seen many you know, multinationals come and develop the projects themselves. 
uh, and then you know bring in their sort of home market banks to come and finance it. But I think we need to now, as the financiers on the continent, we need to be seeing to say, what do we need to do to, to push both these sets of projects? You know, one that is government-led, that will be sort of your ports, your bridges, and, and, and everything else. And then the others that is, you know, that, that generates uh, employment and generates economic activity, as you talked about. And that will come with track record, and that yeah. will come with, you know, churning and doing more deals, you know. And, and I think it's, all our, it's, it's you know, in all our interest to get it right. I don't think it's. I don't think it's not happening. It's happening, but I don't think it's happening at the rate that we would like it to happen. Right, right. So let's let's unpack the money issue, uh, Patrick. And especially as you know, as we were preparing for this panel, you were talking about the fact that um, yes, we've got some of the fastest growing economies on this continent, but we also have most of the least developed. Uh, yeah. countries in the world. I mean, how does that play out by way of us discussing, uh, discussing infrastructure development? And I mean, just uh, to, to throw one more um, ingredient into that, that, that question, the idea of these mega projects that we are pursuing by way of roads and, and dams and bridges and all of that. I mean, how, how does that work for a, a country that is just at the minimum level of, of development? I think that highlights the challenges, the, or the extent of challenges, actually, that we face as a continent. Because of the 47 least developed countries out there in the world, about 33 of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, least developed countries means these are fragile states. It means these are countries that are dependent on donor funding for their central fiscus. So when you have donors funding your, your central fiscus, it says you, you also will have to keep on going to them for the permission in terms of how much commitment you can make as a center for how much, how many projects or how much you can be able to backstop or guarantee as a center, because at the end of the day, it means effectively they are doing that backstopping mm. of the projects. So which then says, unless we are innovative and creative in, in structuring these projects in such a way that they do not need central fiscal backstop or guarantees, it's gonna be very difficult. Also, what it says, the backlog of infrastructure projects that have got to be undertaken in many of these countries is much more bigger. The study done by the World Bank, uh, or, or, uh, this is Dr. Marianne Fay and, 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 and Julia, Dr. Julia Roberts. Uh, this is a study that actually it was released this year in February. It's titled Beyond the Gap, How Can Countries Breach the Gap for the Sustainable Development Goals? Here they were looking at what are the chances and how much should countries be undertaking. They actually concluded that we need between 2 and 8% uh, of our GDP per annum to spend on infrastructure so that we have a chance of achieving our sustainable development goals come 2030. So now these countries have got to spend much more mm. than that. But where does it come from? But the thing is their models. We have we have the PPP models that says, especially economic infrastructure, these countries do not necessarily have to do them by themselves, but they can be able to work on the right regulatory environment and the right policy environment to make sure that the private sector can be able to come in to invest on these projects without their central fiscal sector taking the strain. So these are quite possible, but we need very strong and courageous leadership who are going to be able to come up with very compelling visions for their countries. And also we need the likes of John Rockefellers in the US. In the early ages of the US coming up, you had those businessmen who believed that they had to put in infrastructure, the rail infrastructure across Europe. So on the continent, I think the likes of Patrice Mutsipes of this world, the, the Aliko Dangotes of this world, they have to be, we need to see more of people like those really driving serious infrastructure because now with the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it says your infrastructure network that will enable this intercontinental trade has got to be facilitated on a very sound infrastructure so that our Continental Free Trade Agreement can be able to give meaning to the people of the continent in terms of economic prosperity and job opportunities. Of course, That's, of th th that is what actually we're faced with. But I do believe that the advent of technology, we are now in the exponential, exponential technology mm. era, which then says what could not be possible or could not be done before, we can now be able actually to leapfrog those barriers and be able actually to see ourselves doing those things. So there is a plethora of possibilities given certain 
technologies that we can be able to employ to help us actually to get there much more quicker. And the right leadership. But of course, I mean, it's Patrick, when we're talking about the pressures to the fiscus of many um, African uh, uh, countries, particularly the least developed ones, I mean, it's not even a problem of just the least developed, on, least developed ones. We are the biggest and we're the most developed and we've got pressure to our balance sheets as well. Uh, TP, at the start of the conversation, you mentioned a different kind of possible uh, products, structured yeah. products so that we can leverage to, mm -hmm. to, to finance mm -hmm. and to take less or take or strain from, mm -hmm. from governments. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of color as to what you were thinking yeah. there. Thank you. Uh, I just want to go back again to my theme, if you like, about partnerships and how crucial they are to making things happen. And I would like to take a couple of uh, maybe two or so practical examples. Uh, there's a project where we are putting in a lot of money at this point in time as risk capital to develop it, uh, together with a, an engineering firm. But the engineering firm eventually will not be the implementer of the project. They conceptualize it, they put it together. The point that I'm going to is that one of the key ingredients is that in the early stages of developing a project, if a technical partner can be brought into the equation, that by itself increases the prospects of realization of that project at a later stage. Uh, what we have found, and <laughs> we've been at the IDC now for about seven months or so, and I found substantial amounts of risk equity that we have put into, into, into projects, but actually we are in the cusp of realization, but there's no strategic partner to take that project to implementation. And uh, we have to go through a long cycle. That's the one thing. The second thing is how crucial uh, counterparties are, particularly those that are uh, regulatory parties. There is a water project that we are looking at. Yeah, uh, It is such that uh, the project has a bulk water uh, element to it. But downstream, there is a, a huge infrastructure for reticulation and distribution of water. So you then have two government jurisdictions. One is the national department responsible for bulk water. And then downstream is the district and the municipality responsible for local reticulation. So we are trying to conceptualize this and address regulatory risk around that project. But guess what? We're dealing with so many parties. And so it requires a lot of patience, a lot of persuasion to, to try and overcome and bring everybody on board. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it so happens, and I think this is common knowledge, that at times uh, the regulatory enablers who are supposed to decide don't decide particularly quickly on matters like this. I mean, lastly, we know, and Patrick can talk a lot about this, that some of the most viable and technically feasible project around border systems and managing mm. uh, logistic systems across borders can be undertaken by the private sector, can be funded. There's enough by way of uh, 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 cargo that goes through the systems to make the projects viable. But guess what? You need an inter-country agreement mm. that governs that special area for that. And then what you then have is, unfortunately, in some instances, uh, countries not coming to the party soon enough to clear the regulatory hurdles. So again, I mean, we're talking about the theme of leadership, and I think that is maybe something that we can un un unpack next round. I think mm. if I can just add on, I mm. mean, I think that, that enabling environment, yes. you know, be it even putting together an IPP payment structure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, getting, uh, you know, two sets of parties because something crosses mm. borders to getting that together, it is it is a hindrance. It's an absolute hindrance, and I, and I totally agree with TP is that you know, all, all these are enablers to, to get more projects uh, in motion because from, you know, if somebody is developing a project, they want to know what tariffs they will get when they build a, a, a solar power or thermal power plant. Mm -hmm. What's, what, what are they going to get paid? How are they going to get paid? And, and, you know, will that agreement hold up? And, uh, and I think we are seeing, you know, that sometimes moves at really snail pace. I mean, just to add to, to, to what you have said uh, regarding that, I was speaking with a, a, um, a very, I think he's a very rich man, he's a very successful man, he built one of the most successful companies on this continent, and he was telling me that he had been in contact, or he had been contacted by a, a government, I won't mention, but a very large government, in fact, one of the biggest in the world, about uh, putting money into South Africa specifically. They had a large sum of money that they were looking to put in, but it was that aspect of the changing regulatory lands landscape that made them a bit unsure 
sure mm -hmm. about, you know, whether is it is a time will I get my return or not. But just finally, before we uh, really mm -hmm. um, move on to the next uh, topic, and also perhaps if you have got comments that you'd like to contribute at this stage, just just indicate so. But uh, Vivian, you have done a lot of work with 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 uh, projects whereby money was was an issue, budget was an issue, and right now this issue of um, many African countries having too much exposure to foreign uh, denominated debt. Mm -hmm. um, some might not have as much, but are taking advantage of the fact that interest rates and borrowing costs are so low abroad that they're going that way. Um, just your advice in, 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 in navigating that, that landscape to, yes, you take advantage of cheaper money, but also not to the detriment of, of, of longer uh, potential risks down the line. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you, Fifi. I think um, I have, well, I agree largely with what my uh, fellow panelists have said, but I think um, what we're addressing here is more the symptoms rather than the real problem. I mean, why are uh, our governments fiscally constrained uh, when we all know and we all agree that uh, Africa is probably the most uh, well-endowed continent in, in the world? You know, we are resource-rich. Why are we resource rich underground and uh, resource poor, financially poor mm -hmm. on the surface? And I think until we address um, the kind of uh, relationships we have engaged in uh, for the sale uh, or exploitation of our commodities, we're not going to be able to address uh, the challenges, the financial challenges that we face. So uh, we can structure, the umpteen ways that we can structure a project, but the funding is, is limited, mm -hmm. and there's just so much you can do. I think um, as Africans, there needs to be a conversation, uh, particularly for those that are, are coming into natural resources now, as to how they actually structure the, the transactions or the concessions uh, relating to extraction of natural resources. Mm -hmm. And this is to ensure that they get a reasonable uh, return for their resources, which will obviously then improve their financial and fiscal uh, position. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, on the surface, or at, as it is now, it's very, very difficult uh, to find ways, creative ways, to actually finance projects uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, and you've referred to cheap money. Uh, I don't think Africa borrows cheap money. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, that is the perception. Mm -hmm. um, most African countries that are B-rated, I think the, the, the highest ratings are in the B range, uh, for South Africa, countries like South Africa, uh, probably Namibia, Botswana, and the rest, uh, you would be borrowing five, six, seven percent uh, on the dollar, and that is expensive money. I mean, we know that uh, other uh, communities or other economic communities uh, in Europe are struggling to finance on almost zero mm -hmm. percent. Uh, they're not doing much, so we are borrowing at six percent, and some of us at ten percent or eleven percent as countries to finance infrastructure. That is extremely expensive. And it's not a prudent way, uh, in my view, to finance infrastructure. And then added to that, there is the foreign currency uh, element of it. In an environment where inflation is going up, our uh, currencies are depreciating, uh, commodity prices are also declining, um, it becomes a very difficult um, situation for government to manage, either through fiscal policy or even a monetary policy. So what we've tended to advocate uh, at the bank, at the East African Development Bank, is to finance as much of our infrastructure in local currency. Uh, so in, the, in terms of structuring, you strip out all the costs that can be paid for in local currency, or even if they can be paid for in foreign currency, it's currency that you can buy at the spot rate and pay for that uh, cost and then only leave out the, uh, the parts of the project that must be financed through foreign currency. And typically those are management fees or transfer fees or things like that, or equipment purchase, if it's very large equipment. Mm -hmm. So it's really to mix uh, as much as possible the currency pool that you use for a project. Mm -hmm. If it's a road, uh, the tolls are going to be collected in, local in, in local currency. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you in want some countries. <laughs> <laughs> this could end up being a, a whole day. So if, if it's going to be collected in, if it's an energy project, uh, the bills will be paid in, in, uh, in local currency but pegged to the currency of the debt. Yeah. So it will be local currency to the dollar. And obviously what that does is transfer the cost 
of that energy to the consumer. And that has a knock-on effect, of, obviously, on your economic and other you know, development. So I think I still go back to the position that Africa needs to uh, style up. We need to think about our resources, how we can maximize return on them. And if we did that, then we would not have, be having these conversations. All right. Can I, can yeah. I, can I actually uh, take off on that point, though, and especially from a private sector point of view, yeah. as many African economies try to ensure that you know, there's, there's more value add from their minerals that come from the ground via mm -hmm. beneficiation or maybe more um, you know, stringent uh, empowerment requirements for, do, for, for um, you know, approving a, a deal here, to what extent is that a... I don't want to call it a barrier because I think at the end of the day, if we are going to achieve any form of sustainable development goals, we do need to ensure that the community and there is some form of give back um, that takes place within the transaction. But maybe speak, for, speak to it from a South African point of view. Foreign nationals wanting to fund infrastructure projects here, being told that no, 30% of that needs to go towards a black empowerment. How does that sit with these foreign companies that are wanting to, to come here? <laughs> I, I can talk from examples, right, and, and, yeah. and what we see. I mean, I think the reality is that if there's a business case, if, if it makes sense, you know, South Africa is not the only country in the world that has, uh, you know, laws where you have to, you know, either diversify your shareholding and, 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 and things like that. You have it in, 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 in other countries, in, in Asia and, and elsewhere. Um, I, I think it comes down to, you know, does, does this make sense? Uh, it, will this give us a return? Um, and we have seen, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, over the last few years, maybe it's slowed down a little bit, but over the last few years, there has been, you know, um, a decent investment in South Africa. Unfortunately, I think we know um, with President Cyril Ramaphosa's big drive to ramp up uh, FDI because it has slowed down quite drastically. Um, it, it's about, you know, it's about, it's about bringing in that diversity uh, and the reality is that from, from the clients that we work with, uh, a lot of our multinationals have, uh, you know, um, very good partners and, um, you know, and I think it's about, you know, how, how to build upon that business. Um, I think, you know, if I can just touch on, on Vivian's point uh, on the local currency financing, I mean, uh, from a risk management point of view, absolutely agree. The reality is also in a lot of our markets, local raising local currency financing is very expensive. And that's why I think sometimes, you know, a project is, is weighed up to say, you know, even at, uh, you know, even at some very high dollar, uh, you know, rates um, compared to double digits, high teen local currency borrowing, you know, you have to weigh it up. But I think from a risk management point of view, you know, it's, it's very critical. And this is where, you know, we can have the emergence of, you know, local currency bonds mm. specifically for, you know, infrastructure development. And South Africa has led away, I, I think, has led the way in that, you know, municipal bonds and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Mm. I think other markets in Africa have not maybe followed suit mm -hmm. as, as, as quick as we would like. But that is the Perhaps way also to their markets, move their financial markets are uh, less sophisticated. Yeah, so than this, and it will take have. time to, 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 to come up, you know. So I, I think that's one aspect. If I can just give some examples also in terms of, you know, you talked about innovative products. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, Patrick and TP may allow me, one of the things that we've looked at is blended finance. And this is where, you know, working with multilateral organizations, we worked with MIGA mm -hmm. about two, two and a half years ago, three years ago with DBSA and with Land Bank when TP was, uh, when TP was CEO there. Um, we arranged uh, financing, Standard Charter arranged uh, $500 million between the two institutions uh, with, a, with a MIGA guarantee. MIGA came in and, and they gave a guarantee to say, you know, we, 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 we like what the organizations are doing, how they're being run, how the use of funds are going to be used towards for land bank, towards, you know, mm. b b building the land bank's agricultural portfolio for DBSA financing outside of South Africa. Um, and we were able to put that together in a very tumultuous time, you know. Sure. Mm. But it is, it is an opportunity to move away from the reliance on government and to bring in, you know, uh, the multilaterals who are also sitting outside who want to be part of this uh, development. And World Bank has played a, a very active role in many of our projects also, uh, speci specifically on infrastructure. So it's about, you know, it's, it's, that innovativeness also is, is very important so uh, for, us to, you know, for us to drive uh, forward. At the stage, is there any contributions that would like to be raised here in the room? If you can just raise your hand and we'll try and get a mic to you as you maybe think about what you want to say. Uh, it's the fourth industrial revolution and what did come up was the fact that it will help us leapfrog a lot of um, areas where we are lacking behind. Uh, 
invite us into your thinking specifically on how that will happen. And especially, I mean, we're talking about inclusive growth and shared prosperity. The role of, of young people who play quite heavily in the, the, the 4IR space right now. Um, so 4IR in helping uh, grow this development pipeline and also just added onto that the role that young people who are actually the most unemployed, I think we've got the continent with the most uh, young people without jobs, the role that they can play and how you guys are facilitating that. Patrick. Thanks, Fifi. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution actually is quite an interesting phenomenon, especially for the continent of Africa and other emerging markets. Mm. Because for, for the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, many of the emerging market countries actually were <coughs> bystanders. And the thing is, this fourth industrial revolution is very well defined and articulated by the exponential technologies that we are seeing actually coming up all across us. You, here you're talking about even this issue of, of, of local currency financing. The fintechs that actually are coming up are beginning to solution for some of these challenges. So Bitcoin is financing some of these the, 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 That uh, uh, blockchain technology is also that, but there are also some other fintech platforms, transaction platforms, that enables you to be able to settle two counterparties in their local economies with their local currencies without actually getting to have access to the dollar. So the, the effective like this is intermediating actually the dollar. Mm. They need actually to access the dollars to pay the person in market A when actually the other one is in market B. So we, this is quite an exciting time. Again, talking about this in, in exponential technologies, you, here you're talking about the Internet of Things uh, or the Industrial Internet of Things. There is no reason why we cannot start to see smart infrastructure sure. being put in place. There is no reason why we cannot see uh, uh, water treatment infrastructure or wastewater treatment infrastructure not having the sensors that actually can be able to alert you before the pipe bursts. Mm. Or if the pipe, if there is a leakage, it alerts you in good time that here there is this problem and it gives you the triangulation actually of, of the exact co coordinates where the problem is. Or it's, it then gets to manage and lowers the pressure so that you don't end up losing much water if there's a, there's a water a, a pipe burst. Or even the, the, if there's going to be a blockage in, in your sewer articulation infrastructure, it then definitely can be able to tell you that at this specific point, this is what you're going to have within the next, given the, the, the rate of flow of that. There's no reason why you cannot have dynamic traffic management systems where if you actually have a bunching up or gridlock traffic in a particular direction, that the robots can be able actually to recognize that and start managing the, 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 the traffic accordingly and allowing where there is gridlock to, to, to flow much more quicker. Thereby, you, you then get to minimize the, the delays, you get to minimize the impact on the environment. Then we get to give those ladies and gentlemen that try to direct us this a is bit a of thing. a break. And Absolutely. <laughs> so, so we are at that time, also when you look at the fourth industrial revolution, the, the, you also are talking about the robotic process automation mm. and, and, this, and this artificial intelligence, the predictive data analytics, which then says what we could not solution for, what we could not know with, or we could not see with our naked eyes. Now, which all the system can be able to alert us. Way before, we used to say you cannot build collusion before. But now, with predictive analytics, you can be able actually to pick those things up. You have kind of virtualize your internal controls where you can be able to see problems way before actually they, they, they engulf you or they, they get out of control. But so, can you? But yes. can you? And maybe, TB, this is something that you can add in here because a lot of the, the, the a lot of, there's a proponents or a group that say that, I mean, specifically Africa, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. It's a nice buzzword, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. AI, all mm -hmm. of this, all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, on the ground, though, how does that change materially yeah. and it's, let's let's keep it to infrastructure projects now are you seeing deals coming on the table whereby someone is saying oh okay i want to build this road and with this road i want to ensure that there's fiber there so that you know this is a wi-fi hotspot and 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 is that what you're seeing on the table uh, if you don't mind i will talk more to the idc's industrial uh, space yeah uh, so the, the, this particular matter is quite big for the IDC because remember the IDC is a huge investor in mining, in manufacturing and so on. This is 
an organization has has in excess almost 150 billion rand worth of investments in various uh, uh, industries. So, one, there is a specialist unit uh, at the IDC, for lack of a better name, we call it New Industries. Mm -hmm. It is a, a unit which is specifically focused on uh, addressing and responding to the kind of things that Patrick was just talking about now. But let's take it to the practice. What do we see? Uh, a lot of clients approach us and they are seeking to modernize their factories, for instance. I mean, they have been running a plan for the past number of years they need to modernize today. A series of questions arise regarding uh, are there technologies that can enhance better product development, for instance. In the automotive industry, uh, uh, to what extent can a particular OEM company use technology to cluster its uh, supply base and integrate it effectively into its supply chain? and therefore managing the logistics and hopefully in the process improving efficiencies, driving costs down. In the mining sector, the most uh, pressing issues, of course, yes, productivity in terms of increasing uh, yield performance of mines, but safety issues sure. and environmental impact issues. And so, to be honest with you, as an organization, uh, I think strategically we are very clear as to where we should go, uh, but we understand that we have to work with industry organizations, the actual people who run the mines and the factories uh, to embrace technologies and uh, working in partnership with them. So it's an external thing, but obviously internally as an organization as well, uh, I'm always thinking about how uh, workplaces can be made great workplaces to uh, imp uh, improve uh, employee value propositions and uh, the way employees are treated and customer service interfaces and so on. And all this play Give us into free Wi-Fi <laughs> in the building and we don't have to work from our desk in our office. We can work from anywhere. From our, you, you'll have happy workers. Um, Vivian, I mean, East Africa, we look at it from here in the south with admiration in terms of the technolo technological yes. advances that mm -hmm. have been achieved yes. there. But, I mean, to what degree has that actually been in the infrastructure space specifically? What are you seeing there? What should we be on the lookout in terms of new innovations from the infrastructure space coming mm -hmm. out of East Africa? Okay, um, I, I think for, for East Africa, um, the, f the fourth industrial revolution has really uh, been of great interest. And as you said, uh, the large, the bulk of the population there is young. Mm -hmm. So we have a, we have a huge uh, a group of youth who have come out of school and they have been socialized uh, with the internet and with uh, computers and uh, that sort of technology. So in terms of the innovations that are coming up, there are myriad interventions. Every, every other week there's something new that has come up. And what some of the uh, larger uh, companies have done is to develop um, sort of science and technology hubs mm -hmm. which uh, help youth or young people to uh, innovate new uh, solutions to businesses. So essentially for much of the business challenges that would be there in terms of payment systems, in terms of uh, uh, cost control, in terms of monitoring product, mm -hmm. there are innovations that have been developed by uh, you know, very innovative and very skilled young people. Mm -hmm. But now looking at it more broadly uh, in terms of a revolution which is global, and as was said, uh, I think Africa was a bystander in the first three. And we are thinking that we don't want to be a bystander in the fourth or a purchaser of technology in the fourth. Rather, we want to be a generator and a creator of technology in the fourth. And how can we do that? Uh, we know that Africa has not produced enough scientists or where it has produced those scientists, they have not been well resourced. Uh, there's uh, not much... Uh, in terms of the training available on the continent at all levels, you know, right from uh, primary school all the way to the university. So at the East African Development Bank, we have taken the step of actually financing training for teachers in uh, STEM subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and we do this in partnership with universities uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the United States, Ivy League colleges, where we actually finance the entire program and training. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that these teachers will then come back uh, and go back to the schools that uh, they were attached to. These are public sector mm. 
teachers, not private schools. Uh, they have to be teachers working for government and we want them. And we expect for them to go back and teach and train uh, the young students coming up in, in science mm -hmm. subjects. We need to understand why it is that we are not producing enough scientists. Why don't we have enough engineers? Mm -hmm. uh, because this will be an age where science um, would probably uh, count a lot more. Not, we're not saying that the arts will not count, but there will be a heavy requirement for scientists on the continent. I must say, they say that the arts right now is uh, one of the industries that can't be um, easily uh, replicated or replaced by uh, robots. So the <laughs> arts will still count for now. Just as we yeah. wrap up, because we are left with around four minutes, the issue that did come up quite strongly amongst everything else that needs to be done to you know, fund infrastructure more and grow this pipeline, it was the issue of leadership. And I think that it is a poignant uh, place yeah. for us to, 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 to end this conversation. From a private uh, perspective, um, leadership and how that trickles down to for actually saying yes to, to, to investing or to partnering with the private sector. I'm um, safe in a minute if you can just kick that conversation off for us and we'll just have parting thoughts from the rest of the panelists. Look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we'll see here at the WEF in the next few days, uh, we had a huge delegation in Japan last year at the T TCAD uh, summit uh, be between African heads of state and, and the Japanese government. I think the, the, the will is there. The, the, the knowledge of the problem is on hand. Um, uh, sometimes the means are where we have a, a struggle to get up to. Um, and, you know, you have uh, leaders uh, in East Africa. Again, you know, we talked about, um, you know, the innovation on, on technology. But it's also the leadership that have led from the front, right? And they've driven that, that technology, which is also uh, very critical. So, you know, I, I feel that, uh, you know, from a private sector point of view, um, you know, we know what the problem is. You know, we know roughly what the solution is going to be. It's how do we create that enabling environment right across from regulatory to, to you know, to uh, local currency, cost of funding, because, you know, all of that has, has, has a bit. And it's how do we all work hand in hand? And I think TP, you know, called it correctly to say, you know, it's a partnership as opposed to competition. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That we all have to, you know, we have to leave our hats behind, enter in the room, and, and really try and find solutions, uh, you know, for, for the betterment of the continent. It is a partnership because it is also very embarrassing as host countries, uh, Patrick and TP, that we are seeing some of the uh, atrocities uh, that is happening to um, not foreign nationals, but black uh, foreign uh, nationals from the rest of the continent by way of these xenophobia attacks. Of course, I mean, it doesn't only, uh, lim it's not limited only to South Africa because we're seeing issues of security and um, insurgency by various militia across the continent as well. Just just your message to the leadership um, and how to ensure that that is not a hindrance to, 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 to future investment projects or to individuals like SAFE doing business on the continent. Uh, I think you know what we are witnessing is quite uh, uh, shameful, I must say, as a, as a, as a South African. Uh, it, it's, I look into this thing, I, I, I don't want to look at it actually as xenophobia, uh, I look at it as a brazen criminality which is quite inducting for us as a country and as a society, because in functional societies, these things do not happen. Mm -hmm. And in functional societies, there is law enforcement if there is any crim uh, uh, element of criminality on any part. And, and for us to witness th what we are witnessing, it actually makes you to want to shave your head in shame. Really, it is something that we, both private and public uh, sector leadership, has got. We have to rise to the to the bridge. We have to step into the bridge, and make sure that we call this thing for what it is, and make sure that we bring it to an end. Completely unacceptable. There can never be any justification, <laughs> because now we are talking about the the the, the continental free trade agreement. We are talking about the success and economical integration of the continent. How does that happen? on the back of these kinds of tendencies that actually we're seeing on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if we were to look into these things, the, the country that stands to benefit the most e with this continental free trade agreement is this country. Mm -hmm. and, country. And we need to be seen to be embracing our, our fellow brothers and sisters from the rest of the continent. We need to be seen to be working together with each other and making sure that, 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 that we work in harmony and we are able actually to deal with issues if, when issues actually crop up. But it's something that we really need to call it out what it is mm -hmm. and be quite 
bold in making sure that leadership from across the spectrum of a society step up and bring an end to this madness? Sure, Tipi. Thank you, Fifi. Um, this, as Patrick says, uh, the events in South Africa at the moment uh, are happening on the back of leaders having agreed to the principles of a free trade agreement of some sort. The reality is this. As a continent, we are unlikely to see the benefits and the beneficial impacts of such a, an initiative, a policy initiative, unless security and peace prevails across the continent. That's, that's, that's point number one. Point number two, can we, the people of the African continent, please realize that nations succeed and fail on the back of the strength of their institutions? Whether it is private institutions, whether it's public institutions, when institutions collapse, nations collapse. So we should be very careful as South Africans, as Africans on the continent, not to destroy the very foundations that are important for our own success and viability as nation states. So that is what I would appeal for, that we should be very careful that the rest of the world is moving ahead mm -hmm. and the kind of strife that we are generating amongst ourselves can only cause us to regress and even lag even further behind the nations of the world. For sure. I mean, we're talking about uh, what's a marketplace of 3.4 trillion rand yeah. being at risk here. But Vivian, final thoughts yeah. from you? Um, well, as regards infrastructure, I think uh, careful planning uh, mm. in terms of uh, looking forward, mm. careful sourcing of funding, and also a thorough due diligence on the partners that uh, we engage with. Yes. Well, and that brings to an end our discussion. Thank you so much for engaging us. And, of course, thank you to the audience for taking time to come and join us to listen to this conversation here. As you are aware, it is a, an agenda that is completely full. We have just started the day here, but there are so many events that will all be tailored around, of course, a growing Africa and also ensuring that we achieve inclusive growth against this backdrop of a fourth industrial revolution, where, as the panelists did say earlier on that many African uh, countries do not want to be bystanders to this industrial uh, revolution that is underway. Mm -hmm.